Well, if you have a Bible, and I hope you or somebody around you does that you can look on with, let me invite you to open with me to Nehemiah chapter 1 in the Old Testament. Feel free to use table of contents if you need to. Nehemiah chapter 1, and as you're turning, I want to welcome those of you in Loudoun and Prince William, Montgomery County, as well as those who are listening in from Arlington as we wait to get into our new physical location there. And then those of you online, it's good to be together around God's Word. I've been really looking forward to it this Sunday in particular, though admittedly it's not all that I or we hoped it would be. I say that broadly when I think about businesses and schools and the world, not where we had hoped we would be in the fall of 2021. I was looking back this week at some notes from a sermon I preached in May 2020, and I said, and I quote, we hope to kick things into high gear as a church this fall. And just talking about, I mean, surely by then we'll be open back up and everything will be getting back to normal. Uh, and I was referring to fall 2020 at that point. Obviously last fall didn't turn out like the way we had hoped when it comes to COVID cases. And so we started working toward kicking into high gear this fall and a Delta variant came along and COVID cases have arisen yet again. So we're not where we all wanna be but by God's grace, we are here. I think about Pastor John Jenkins at First Baptist Church Glen Arden in our city. Today is the first day they are gathering back in person in the last year and a half. And Pastor Jenkins, I think I mentioned to you, had shared with me, they've had so many funerals in their church and their community over the last 18 months. And I was texting with him last night, just telling him I was, we are praying for them as they come together for the first time on a Sunday. In fact, I wanna, I wanna invite us to do that. I want us to pray for that church and for other churches across our city. Would you bow your heads with me? God, we, we pray for other churches across our city right now and specifically for First Baptist Glen Arden as they gather for worship for the first time in a year and a half in person on a Sunday, we pray that your presence would be strong among them. They would be deeply encouraged as they sing and they shout and they pray and they listen to your word and they worship you. God, we pray that for churches all across our city, for your evident presence and blessing in their midst for the Church of the Redeemer in MoCo, for Cornerstone and KCPC and Trinity Church in Loudoun, for McLean Presbyterian Church in Fairfax and Park Valley in Prince William and CHBC and ARC in the district. God, we pray for your blessing on churches all across our city who are gathering right now to sing your praise and proclaim your gospel, even as we ask for your blessings on this church family, all for the spread of your glory and your kingdom in our city among all the nations. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We wanna regularly pray for churches across our city. I would encourage you when you drive by a church building, like pray for God's blessing on his word and that body of brothers and sisters in Christ. And, and I mention that particularly today because I'm about to talk about our church family, who we are, what God is doing here, but I don't want that ever to come across in a sense of comparison or competition with other churches. That is not the way the Bible calls us to think about other churches ever. Like we are we rejoice in Bible-believing, gospel-proclaiming churches all across our city. We certainly don't think every Christian needs to be in this particular church in Metro Washington, D.C., and we gladly work with churches all across our city. We're not building our kingdom. We're building a much bigger kingdom. We want to see God's kingdom come through churches across our city and around the world, for that matter. And the more churches there are that are proclaiming the gospel, the better. At the same time, today I do want to celebrate God's grace in this church family at this moment. 
And specifically, I want to call every single Christian here today to commit or if you're already committed, recommit in a sense, your life to a local church, whether it's here at NBC or one of the many other churches in our city, to resolve not to just attend a church, but to commit your life to a local church, to loving the members of that church, to following the leaders of that church, and to accomplishing the mission of that church. So let me say that one more time. I want to challenge every Christian here today to commit your life to a local church. If this is already true in your life, to in a sense recommit your life today in a fresh way to a local church, to loving the members of that church, the people who make up that church, to following the leaders of that church, to be in a church where you can do Hebrews 13, 17, and gladly submit to the authority and direction of leaders who stand before God as shepherds who will give an account, and to accomplish the mission of that church, to be in a church where you believe in and are committed to how that church is carrying out mission. God has designed for every Christian to be committed to a church like that. The church was never intended to be a building that you go to once a week. The ch church was never intended by God to be an event that you attend every once in a while. The church of God was never, never intended by God to be a program that you participate in. The church is designed by God to be a family of brothers and sisters committed to each other as they accomplish a mission together. And if God's calling you to be a part of this family at NBC, I want you today to know what that mission is in such a way that you can say, yes, I want to be a part of that, or you could decide, I think I want to be a part of God's mission and one of these other great churches. And at the same time, I know there are some, many here today, who are not yet even Christians. You've not made the decision to follow Jesus. And today, God has brought you here to give you an opportunity to make that decision today. And I want to invite you to make that decision today. So, if the church is not a building or an event or a program, but it's a family on a mission, then what's the mission of this NBC family? And I want to answer that question in two ways. First, by just walking through the way that we summarize our mission as a church family. that may be new for some or maybe just a refresher for many. And then second, I want to show you this mission specifically through the lens of the book of Nehemiah and specifically as it relates to this moment in our church. Let me start with the way we summarize our mission at NBC in one sentence. So this is how we summarize who we are, what we do as a church family. We glorify God by making disciples and multiplying churches among all nations, beginning right here in greater Washington, D.C. That is the mission of this church family. And so I put that up there. Like This is not just words for the sake of words to kind of have something to say. Like This sentence drives everything we do together. Think about it. We glorify God through worship gatherings every week. This is why we come together like we are right now. And we do this every week we possibly can. Not just when it's convenient for our schedules or when we're not doing something else. No, members of this family prioritize coming together every week for worship because we want to sing and shout and pray and hear the word of God and celebrate the Lord's Supper and celebrate baptisms. As God's transforming different people's lives. This is our, our family gathering before our good Father every single week that we prioritize in our lives because it's really good to be together with our Father and we pray it's really good glorifying to him in a way that then leads us to scatter and do what we say to do when we leave every one of these gatherings. Therefore, go and make disciples and multiply churches among all the nations through church-wide ministries for preschoolers and kids and students and young adults and those with special needs. Think about what's happening even right now while we're in this gathering as, as children and preschoolers and those with special needs are hearing about God's word and seeing God's love in action specifically for them. Or you think about 
ministries like preparing for marriage or re-engage to help couples in this way or that way and all kinds of other ministries that, by the way, don't just happen out of nowhere. They happen because members of this family commit to serving kids and students and those with special needs and couples and this way or that way, whatever it might be. And I want to encourage you, if you're a part of this family and you're not serving in one of these ways, find a way to serve as we make disciples together through church-wide ministries, through communities like women's Bible studies and men's Bible studies and international fellowships for African, Arabic, Chinese, Ethiopian, French, Filipino, Korean, Latino, Nepalese, Vietnamese, other communities in our church family. As we make disciples through classes that are designed to help you grow in your knowledge of Christianity, your study of God's Word, your ability to care for each other, to process grief or support loved ones, to steward your financial resources. We have all kinds of classes for people who are interested in foster care or adoption, those who want to learn more about global mission, all those aimed at making disciples. And then finally and officially launching today something new church-wide that we've been talking about and building up to called church groups which we envision in the days to come, Lord willing, every member of NBC eventually being a part of, knowing that will take a while. But these groups designed to take this large church and bring it down into personal community for every single member. Church groups designed to do three primary things, CGM, to care for each other well, to grow together in Christ, and to make disciples together on mission in the world, to be a part of a group that looks like the church, like we see in the book of Acts, that kind of community we want to experience in caring for each other, growing together in Christ, and making disciples together on mission in the world. And starting today, you can find information about church groups in the lobby at all of our locations and online. I'll point you to that later on. But all of this aimed toward making disciples together. And if you think about it, if we're actually doing that, if we're actually making disciples, leading more and more people to know and follow Jesus, then we will inevitably multiply as a church. Our goal is not just to get bigger at one location, but to start new locations in different places across our city that are still a part of the NBC family, like we have right now in different locations, and to start new churches all across our city, like City Light Church that was planted not long ago out of NBC, pastored by Nate crew, knowing that Jesus has told us to do this, make disciples, multiply churches, not just among people who look like us or live near us, but among all the nations starting right where we live. So that's why we are committed to global outreach, partnering together with brothers and sisters around the world, sending brothers and sisters around the world for the spread of the gospel. Lord willing, we'll have a service a few weeks from now or we fast and we pray and we ask God like we periodically do at different points during the year. God, who are you calling out from among us to move somewhere else in the world for the spread of the gospel, particularly among people who've never heard it through global outreach? Knowing all of that starts right here through local outreach across our city as we love this city and we care for this city. So you see how this mission forms the framework for everything we do. We believe God has brought us together by his grace as, here's the way I would describe it, a unique family, men and women from over a hundred nations before one father, surrounded by urgent need, over five million people in this city who need the gospel right now. Over three billion people in the world who have little to no knowledge of God's love in Jesus. Never even heard it. And we believe that means we have, as a church family, unprecedented opportunity in the city and around the world to spread God's grace for God's glory. So we are asking God to do Psalm 67 in our midst. God, be gracious to us. Bless us. Make your face to shine upon us so that your ways may be known on the earth. Your saving power known in the city and your saving power known among the nations through us. Now, we've described our prayers as a church this way. God, make us a church that is confident in your word and passionate about your presence. 
We want to boldly believe God's word, passionately engage in God's worship, to pray for that which can only be accomplished by God's power, and to experience. Don't you want to experience that which can only be attributed to God's glory? God, make us a church of radical devotion and radical grace. We want to be finished and done with casual expressions of Christianity and cheap distortions of grace, to love God with everything we have and to love our neighbors truly as ourselves. God, make us a church of justice and generosity, spending our lives and our resources generously to do justice for the poor and the oppressed and the marginalized and the unreached in the world. God, make us a church that expresses diversity as we experience unity. We want to actively grow our church in racial competency and empathy, as well as humility and integrity and relationships with one another, building an environment where people from all kinds of diverse perspectives feel at home. And we are praying, God, make us a church that welcomes and mobilizes all generations and intentionally reaches the next generation to welcome and mobilize men and women from every age and stage of life to show and tell teenagers and children and preschoolers and the unborn who God is and how God works and why God's love is better than life itself. So this is my best attempt to summarize in just a few minutes our mission as a church family and our big picture strategies for organizing ourselves to give everything we have to this mission in the years ahead so that every single member of this church family can be a part of this big picture. NBC is not a building. It's not an event. It's not a program. It's a family on a mission to glorify God by making disciples and multiplying churches among all the nations starting right here. And it's only by God's grace we, be, we get to be a part of something like this. So all of that to summarize who we are as a family at NBC. Now, I want to let this Mission, I hope, soak in in a fresh way today by framing our mission in light of God's word to us in Nehemiah chapter 1 and 2. This is one of my favorite books in the Bible. And there's so much here just at the start of this book. And I'll go ahead and warn you, because of limited time, we're only going to be able to scratch the surface. But even the surface is awesome. But before we read it, we need to understand the context of what's happening here. And whenever I come to this chapter in the Bible, I always think about when I was in college, I was speaking at a youth retreat and I decided to speak on Nehemiah. And I, so keep in mind, this is like when PowerPoint was still kind of pretty fresh down the pipe. Like it was pretty new. And I put together the most killer PowerPoint presentation <laughs> you can fathom in ways that would have awed you back then, but now will look fairly lame to you. But I'm going to show it to you. And I just want you to pretend like PowerPoint is, there we go, there we go. I appreciate the support already, although you still haven't seen it. So uh, I just want you to imagine that PowerPoint is kind of a new thing. And uh, this is like, whoa, I didn't know like all these amazing things could happen. And hopefully, along the way, you'll get a picture of the setup for the book of Nehemiah. So, all right, here we go. It all started. See that? See that map come in? It's like, whoa. Okay. I appreciate, like, you guys are totally into it in here. I don't know what's going on in other locations, but don't, I appreciate, you're making me feel good. Just, you don't have to clap at everything. Uh, I mean, you can, but I I know you'll be clapping inside uh, if you're not. Okay. All right. Anyway. Okay. So here's what happened. Here's the story. Around 597, or no, we'll start, sorry. Start in Jerusalem. So we see Jerusalem over here. In the middle of the city of Jerusalem, there was a temple. Boom. Did you see that? Temple just popped up. Now, (laughs) the temple was the place where the glory of God dwelt in the middle of his people. So where the nations could behold the glory of God. Now, around the city of Jerusalem, with the temple in the middle, there were walls around the city. (laughs) There they go, the walls. One, a couple of them jetting out into the water. Uh, So you had walls around the city until around 597 to 586 BC, the king of Babylon, the armies of Babylon got together and decided 
they were going to come over to Jerusalem, and so they did. There were wows across the room here. I hope this is happening in other locations. I hope you are so mesmerized right now. So they came over, and once they came over, they destroyed the temple and the walls. Like they were there, and they're gone. In 586 BC, the temple and the walls around Jerusalem were totally crushed, burned down. And then the people of Babylon took the people of Jerusalem into exile. Let's send them into exile. Here we go. See them traveling and spreading out. I don't know what the dots are, but it's like people <laughs> spreading out. So you can imagine, like your home totally destroyed. You're then taken from your home to a foreign place, scattered, separated from family and friends, a new place. You don't know what's happening next. Now, that was the story of the exile, and this gives you some context behind it. Prophets were saying this is coming in the Old Testament, or were prophesying to God's people once this had happened. Fast forward to 539 BC, and the Babylonians get taken over by the Persians. And when the Persians take over, they decide anybody among God's people who wants to go back to Jerusalem can get together, and so some do, not all of them, but some do, they get together and they travel back over to Jerusalem. And once they get back to Jerusalem, anybody know the first thing they do? They rebuild the temple. Well done. So let's bring that temple back in 516 BC. This is the book of Ezra. And they rebuild the temple. But what's the problem? There are no walls around the city of Jerusalem, which means the city is open to attack from all sides. And that sets the stage for many years later. So if that's 516 B.C. Fast forward to 444 B.C. And a man named Nehemiah is over in the Persian capital of Susa. And that sets the stage for Nehemiah chapter 1. Now that you are totally blown away, <laughs> hear the word of God in this context. Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 1 says, The words of Nehemiah the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, as I was in Susa the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. That's the area around Jerusalem. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who, has, who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are destroyed by fire. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, this is one of the great prayers in the Old Testament. I'm not going to have time to dive into it all today. But just, just hear this prayer. O oh Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant, and I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples, which is what had happened. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and your, by your strong hand. O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name. That's a great phrase. They delight to fear your name. Give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. And who's this man? Nehemiah tells us, now I was cupbearer to the king. All right, let's pause here. We're going to come back to Nehemiah 2 in just a second. But there's so much here. And here's why this text came to my mind specifically when I was praying about this day in our church family. And this 
call for every single Christian to commit yourself to a local church, this one or another one, specifically in this time, in a time of rebuilding. And we have walked, and we are still walking through a global pandemic unlike anything any one of us has experienced. We have experienced and are still experiencing all sorts of challenges and tensions in our lives, our families, our relationships, our work, our world, and our church, and churches across our country in a way that has left Let's just acknowledge it. Many things around us and in us broken in a way that needs rebuilding. And today, God is calling us individually, as families, as a church family, to rebuild. And specifically to see our call to rebuild our lives, families, church family at this time in a way that parallels Nehemiah's call to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem in that time. So here's the way I want to put it based on God's word. Again, so thinking, reframing our mission as a church in terms of Nehemiah's mission in this chapter, particularly in this moment. Here's how I would put it. In this time of rebuilding, as a church family, two things. One, we are on a mission to care well for God's people, for each other. By God's people here, I'm specifically referring to the people who are part of this church family. Obviously, we want to care well for other Christians, all Christians, for God's people in other churches. We've already talked about that. But thinking specifically here about the people whom God has brought to this church family who have committed to this church family in all the ways we talked about earlier, committed to loving the members of this local church, following the leaders of this local church, and accomplishing the mission of this local church. We're on a mission to make sure that every one of God's people in this church family is cared for well. And that's part of what this Sunday is all about. Let me show you this in Nehemiah, then we'll think about it at NBC. The very first picture we see of Nehemiah in this book, he's asking how the people of God are doing back in Jerusalem. Now keep in mind, you saw it on the map, Nehemiah is far from Jerusalem at this point, and he's got it made. He's living in the king's palace, he's eating the king's food, he's enjoying the king's drink, he's living the Persian dream. But he's concerned about how God's people are doing. And he asks about them. When he does, he finds out that they're in great trouble and shame. That was the language. They're not doing well. And as soon as he hears that, what does he do? He sits down and weeps and mourns for days. He starts praying and fasting before God. His heart is so broken on behalf of broken people. When was the last time, if ever, you wept and mourned for days, fasted and prayed for days on behalf of someone else's brokenness? Now, this is a powerful picture. And from this moment on, Nehemiah is resolved to care well for that people in Jerusalem. He's so concerned about God's people there that he practically forgets about himself the rest of the book. Think about that. Because don't we so oftentimes reverse that? We can become so concerned about ourselves that we practically forget about other people. And Nehemiah was so concerned about other people, he practically forgot about himself. He was on a mission to care well for God's people. Now, in light of this picture in Nehemiah, I want us to ask each other how we are doing, even just in this gathering, 
I wanna do something a little different. So if you have a smartphone, I wanna invite you to pull it out and go to this website, minty.com. I'm just gonna ask you some questions. Let you know you won't have to put your name in here, you won't have to put any information, phone number, anything like that, it's totally anonymous. Um, but I wanna invite as many people as possible to participate in this. And those of you at other locations, uh, we had a little challenges earlier with timing on this. I, I hope this works out well that you'll be able to be a part in the same way. But go to menti.com. It'll ask you to put in a code, put in that code, and then you'll start getting asked questions. And as you put in an answer to a question, it should go to another question, another question. There are 10 questions that are in there. And what I want to do is I want us to just get a picture in just this gallery. In this room and other locations across the city at this moment, how we've been affected by the last 18 months. So if you go there, you should see that first question, if you've not already seen it, over the last 18 months, how much anxiety have you experienced? And I just want us to get a picture of what's represented in the seats next to you right now, even as you share from your own seat, that around 75%, 80% close to it, have experienced a lot or some. But notice, almost half saying a lot of anxiety over these last 18 months. Very few people saying none less than a quarter, a little or none. And you keep going to the next question. Over the last 18 months, how much loneliness have you experienced? And you picture again, over half of people saying, I've experienced some or a lot of loneliness. Since now and between now and when this pandemic started. You keep going. Over the last 18 months, how much anger have you experienced? Again, you're seeing the majority on the left side of these columns, aren't you? One out of four of us almost saying a lot of anger in me over the last 18 months. How much fear have you experienced during these days, fear of the unknown? Fear, well, in a variety of different ways. Just imagine all the different tentacles of fear represented in those two bars on the left. Like, yeah. One out of 10 of us saying, no, no fear over the last 18 months. How much discouragement have you experienced? Look at that. Just the amount of discouraged, disheartened, despairing days that we have walked through. Over the last 18 months, how much marital tension have you experienced? <laughs> there's, there's that not applicable line. <laughs> oh, hopefully for those of you who were kind of at a, at a low point, until now you were like, well, at least I don't have that one. So <laughs> be encouraged. Um, that's interesting though should have I can't do the math off the top of my head but I mean a lot or some marital tension in these last 18 months represented there what about just family tension as a whole you've experienced with your parents maybe a teenager with your parents or maybe with an adult with older parents or with your kids with siblings family tensions around tables. I've had multiple conversations this last week just grieving over tension in families in different ways. Again, over 50% of us, a lot or some. It affects things in our homes. And this, I know, is a, is a big kind of blanket statement, but when you put it all together, mental, emotional, relational, and physical health, how healthy do you feel? 
And not a whole lot of us saying, excellent, tip top right now. And blessings on you if you're in the excellent category, by the way. Great for you. <laughs> and then I didn't include spiritual health because I wanted to separate that out. Over the last 18 months, how would you describe your spiritual health? To realize, yeah, very few of us are thriving spiritually during these days. Then I think the last question there, just what word or phrase describes different emotions or struggles that you've experienced over the last 18 months? And when you think about it and you put different words and emotions in there, it forms a big cloud. And I'll just read you what it looks like. And the more times a word is mentioned, the bigger it is and the more central it is. Right at the middle of this word cloud is fear, frustration, anxiety, sadness, uncertainty, and tired. And then as I look around, disappointment, confusion, discouragement, overwhelming. I, I hope, I hope that just gives you an, a picture of why this mission is so important right now. Why I took the time earlier to talk about church-wide ministries and communities and classes and church groups because can I just point out the obvious? There is no way we're going to help one another with all those emotions and struggles if all we do is sit next to each other in a room once a week. If that is our understanding of church, we've missed the whole point. We've missed the good design of God for our lives in this world. If that's the way we think about church, church is not merely sitting next to each other. Church is sharing life with each other, being in relationship with each other, with people who know our struggles and who are committed to praying for each other and loving each other and serving each other and encouraging each other, building each other up and weeping with those who are weeping and rejoicing with those who are rejoicing. There's 59 one another commands in Scripture, and we cannot carry them out if we just sit next to each other. That's why we are working, starting today in a fresh way and I mentioned it's going to take a while, but we want every member of NBC to be in a, a body of believers, a church group where you are being cared for in your life, where you're growing together in Christ, where you can say, I'm pursuing Jesus, and I've got people around me helping me pursue Jesus, and together we're locked arms, and we're making disciples on mission in the world. We've said our prayer is for every single member of NBC, for God to be able to take you, pick you up, put you anywhere in the world, and you will know how to gather together with other believers, make disciples, lead other people to Jesus, be the church without dependence on buildings or programs or anything else with just the Word of God and the Spirit of God. Amen. So that's, that's what church groups are all about. And I want to call us today, based on God's Word, to see this is our mission to care well for each other, for every single person among the group of God's people known as McLean Bible Church. And then, so to keep going in this time of rebuilding as a church family, then to see that we are on a mission to spread God's glory among all people. And I want you to see this in Nehemiah. So picture him weeping and mourning and fasting and praying. Is all of that just because he's concerned about God's people in Jerusalem? And their well-being, or is it that, and is there something more? Think about it. That temple in the middle of Jerusalem had been rebuilt, a temple that was intended to be a display of God's presence and God's glory, the one true God, Yahweh, the Lord, dwelling among his people, surrounded by nations that worshiped all kinds of false gods. 
So if you're in one of those nations surrounding Jerusalem and you saw this temple, this place supposedly dedicated to the one true God, and then you saw a city in shambles around it with broken down walls, what would you think about that God? You would think that God is weak. That God doesn't take care of his people. And Nehemiah knew, 1 Kings 8, 41 through 43, he knew the design of the temple was to declare God's glory to all the nations so the people from all the nations would come to it and behold his glory. But the exact opposite was happening. Instead of exalting the name of God, Jerusalem was shaming the name of God. Yes, Nehemiah was concerned for the well-being of God's people, but on a much deeper level, Nehemiah was concerned for the glory of God's name. And we know this because you keep reading on in this story. You get to Nehemiah chapter 12. Once they rebuild these walls, you know what they do? They climb up on top. They march around the wall singing and shouting to the glory of God. And the Bible tells us that the sound of their rejoicing could be heard far away as the nation stood in awe of God. And that is what we want to live for. In a time of rebuilding, just like Nehemiah, on a mission to spread God's glory among all people, that's what makes us a church family. We have been saved by a great and glorious and majestic and awesome God, and we want more and more people in this city to know how great and glorious and gracious and majestic and awesome he is. And we want people among all the nations to know how great and glorious and majestic and awesome he is. This is what we live for as a church, to spread God's glory among more and more and more people. So if you're not a Christian today, please listen really closely at this point. We long for you to know God, to know the goodness and the grace and the glory of the one who created you, who breathed life into you and me, created us to know and enjoy him forever, yet we have all sinned against him, turned aside from his ways to our own ways. That's why we experience all of these emotions. We're in a fallen world as fallen people, separated from the fullness of God's goodness because of our sin. And because of our sin, we deserve eternal judgment. But the good news of the Bible is that God loves us. He loves you so much that he has sent his son, Jesus, to live a life of no sin, and then to die on a cross to pay the price for sinners, and then to rise from the grave in victory over sin and death, so that anyone, anywhere, including right here today, no matter who you are, what you have done, if you will turn from your sin and put your trust in Jesus, God's love for you through Jesus, then you will be forgiven of all your sin, and you will be restored to relationship with God forever and ever and ever. We want you to know that. We invite you to put your trust in Jesus today. Make today the day. Don't wait any longer. And then church family, this is what we exist for, to make the good news of our great God known all around us, in this city, and far from us among the nations. So here's what we're going to do starting next week. We're going to begin a series through the Gospel of Mark, the story of Jesus' life. And as we look forward to next Sunday and every Sunday after that, we've got a plan to go through first initial chapters of Mark between next Sunday and, Lord willing, Christmas, every single Sunday. We want to give a glimpse of who Jesus is. And I want to challenge you to invite, starting next Sunday, people you know who don't know Jesus to come with you to see Jesus. So start thinking right now, like teenagers, who are your friends, who, some of whom have never been to church? Young adults, who, who are the, your coworkers that are deconstructing their faith right now or disillusioned by the church and have anything to do with Christianity? For them to see Jesus, bring them. For us all to think about the family members, friends, neighbors, coworkers, people we just so happened to meet this week 
that we have an opportunity to invite to be here next week, specifically next week as we start this series of the Gospel of Mark. Like we're going to think Easter-like. It's just going to be focused on proclaiming the gospel so that people come to know Jesus. Invite people this week to come next Sunday. And then we're going to keep doing that week after week after week. Every week, calling people to repent, be baptized, follow Jesus. Experience the goodness of the grace and the glory of Jesus. This is what we exist for as a church. So let's, let's do this. Let's lean into this as we come into this fall. And let's not just keep our sights focused right here, knowing there are millions in Afghanistan and millions in Yemen and millions in Saudi Arabia and millions in Somalia, and we could keep going on and on and on who need this gospel, who don't have access to it right now. So we're going to pray like we've never prayed and give like we've never given and go however God leads us to go so that they might know his grace and his glory and his love. This is what we exist for as a church, to spread God's glory among all people. And not one Christian in this room, any of the locations we're gathered, not one Christian is intended to be the sideline, on, sit on the sidelines in this mission. God has called all of us to be engaged. No spectator. Let's be finished and done with a spectator mentality in the greatest mission in the world, making the greatest news in the world known among more and more people in ways that will transform their lives for the next 10 trillion years and beyond. It's just, awesome. Let's live for this together. Which leads us to where Nehemiah 2 takes us. I wish we had time to dive into all of this, but I want to just show, I want to show you real briefly what happens after what we just read. Because after Nehemiah prays that prayer, he knows he has a decision to make. And that decision involves a lot of risk. He tells us at the very end of this chapter that he was cupbearer to the king. And cupbearers didn't get vacation days or holidays off. He was a servant in the Persian palace. He was not even allowed to be sad or somber in the presence of the king. If a cupbearer was sad or somber in the presence of the king, he could have his head cut off. But he knew if he had any chance of going from there to Jerusalem to help rebuild those walls, He would have to start by being sad in the king's presence. And then if the king didn't kill him, if the king asked him what was wrong, he'd have to ask the king for permission to go work on those walls, knowing, by the way, that this is the same king who had stopped work on the temple at one point. And then even if the king allowed him to go, think about what he'd be giving up. The comfort, security of that palace for the rigors and dangers of life in a ruined city with all kinds of opposition and threats and slander and attack from outside those walls and from inside those walls. So what did he do? Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 1. In the month of Nisan, the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence. And the king said to me, Why is your face sad, saying you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of the heart. He said, then I was very much afraid. Just feel the tension in his shoes. He's about to go for it. I said to the king, let the king live forever. I just want to butter up the king. Start off the conversation. Looking great today, king. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Then the king said to me, What are you requesting? I love this. So I pray to the God of heaven. He just looks up. God help me. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. He goes for it. The king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, how long will you be gone? When will you return? So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given me to the governors of the province beyond the river, that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah, and a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me tender, timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress of the temple. Now he's really asking for it all. <laughs> for the wall of the city, for the house that I shall occupy. 
goes for it. And the Bible says, the king granted me what I asked, for the good hand of my God was upon me. Ah, oh, isn't that good? Nehemiah, ax, goes. Don't miss it. And then we're going to make the parallel. Nehemiah was not content to sit back and wring his hands in pious concern. Oh, people are hurting. God's not being glorified. I'm just going to stay here in the palace. No. He says, people are hurting. God's not being glorified. I'm going to do something about it. And he acts at great cost to him. And this is the picture. I hope lands in your heart, your seat, right where you are right now. In a hurting world, and a hurting church, people hurting all across this church family all around you right now and all the ways we walk through. Are you going to commit your life to loving some of them, getting involved in their lives and caring for them and helping them grow in Christ and them doing the same thing in your life? And together saying, we're going to make the greatest news in the world known in this city and wherever God leads us in the world. That's action. Who's going to take that step? That's what I mean by calling you to commit your life or recommit your life to a local church. The ways we talk about to loving the members of that church and following the leadership of that church and locking arms together on mission in that church. And if you want to do that... NBC, be part of this church family in that way. Today is the day to start taking some steps. Get plugged into a community or class or church group. There's all kinds of information. Lobby at all of our locations. I also want to make this super simple for you. I'm going to put up a a QR code here on the screen. You can scan this right now if you still got your smartphone out. And it'll immediately take you to that website, mcleanbible.org slash get connected. And at the top of that page, you'll see something about NBC Connect. So if there was one place I would point as many people as possible, it's NBC Connect. That is intended to be the kind of first step for you to learn about NBC and all the ways you can get connected. So that's, that's one thing you'll see at the very top of that page when you go there and then when you go down and you'll see classes and communities and church groups and all kinds of other ways you can get connected on that page. It's time to act. Spend some time in the lobby today on that website. Get connected today here or in another Bible-believing, gospel-preaching church as soon as possible. This is what God has designed you for, for commitment like this in a local church. And then action, NBC family, bring somebody with you next week who doesn't know Jesus. And let's pray and fast this week. Let's ask, let's put aside a meal or two or three and ask God to lead people to Jesus next week and our gathering together. And not just next week, but the week after that and the week after that. Let's pray that God would draw many people to himself. And along those lines, for those of you who have not yet trusted in Jesus to save you from your sin and restore you to relationship with God, I invite you to do that today. Don't wait any longer. And as you do, you are obviously invited to be a part of this church family. Will you bow your heads with me? So we pray, oh God, our Father, I come to you as sons and daughters, brothers and sisters, and we praise you for the privilege of being a part of your church, your family on a mission that nothing else in this world can even begin to compare with. So we pray all together, help us, just like you helped Nehemiah. We look to you, the God of heaven. Help us to do all that you're calling us to do. And in the process, make us, we pray, the church you've designed us to be, a church that's caring well for each other on mission and a church that's making your glory known in the city and beyond the city. God, we pray in light of Nehemiah chapter 2, may your good hand be upon us for the spread of your glory through us. Help us to rebuild in these ways during these days. We pray in Jesus' name. 
Amen.